Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Good afternoon, everyone. On the podcast today is Barbara Ivy. She has a website called theperfectthing.info, which has a lot of fantastic information for us caregivers. And she's also the author of a book called Patterns in Time. It's in brief, kind of a guide for families who are caring for somebody with Alzheimer's like all of us are doing. So thank you, Barbara, for joining me this afternoon. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So our main topic that we had decided to discuss today was what to do when your parent doesn't ask for help with their caregiving responsibilities. And as I was saying before we started recording, I can kind of see how people go down that rabbit hole because my sister has school-aged kids and a full-time job outside the home. I've taken on a lot of responsibilities, and currently this afternoon I'm about ready to just mentally explode and just dump them all on her, which I know will not be beneficial to anybody. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think my sister would appreciate this out-of-the-blue explosion and dumping. And um, it's your story is so much similar to what mine was. So um, my mom had Alzheimer's for 15 years. And um, when she was first diagnosed, my sister had two school age kids, like five and seven. So little guys. And she was just going back to work herself. And I, a few years into my mom's Alzheimer's, decided, oh, this is the time that I've always wanted in life to do something entrepreneurial. Oh, I'm going to do that now. And I left my full-time nice job that I had in order to do something like that. And um, only to quickly learn that probably uh, it would have paid to um, be a lot more realistic about what Alzheimer's had in store. And um, so learn many, many, many lessons throughout this whole thing. So, well, they say learning is good for our brains. So maybe part of the journey, learning everything we can and are forced to learn, maybe that's beneficial in the long run. I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. I think it's also um, the lessons that we learned during Alzheimer's. I think are really good for our hearts as well. So um, I learned a lot of lessons about acceptance, um, forgiveness, um, many important life skills um, throughout the whole experience, how how to be okay with things when they are in chaos, right? I always like things to be nice and neat and tidy. And I learned that there are certain times in life when that's just the nature of things, crazy, (laughs) and that I had to learn how to be okay with that. So I I learned a lot of lessons. Yeah, I've recently learned that, and regular listeners know I'm also a professional photographer, I I can actually see the beauty in people that we, you know, our society doesn't normally see the beauty in. Mm -hmm. Trust me, it's difficult with mom some days. (laughs) But, you know, especially as I was telling Barbara offline, My mom is refusing to go with the hair and nail gal again. And it's just like, I'm about ready to just let her just get wild hair because it's just almost more trouble to deal with than it's worth. (laughs) But that's how I feel this afternoon. I'll probably change my mind tomorrow. And the gal is- Yeah, sometimes sleeping on these things is a good idea, right? Yeah, it's just, but I, there was, um, I was off sightseeing on my own. My husband was at a conference and I- come across various people and I'm always people watching my mom and I go kid watching which you know she loves to do I enjoy it for a little while but I was people watching and sightseeing and you see lots of different types of people and ages and everything and I'm just it's just like dawned on me I'm like I was out of my normal routine and I was like wow you know I can I can appreciate the beauty and the uniqueness of these people that I'm seeing even though Normally, most people would not have seen that. And I was like, oh, I'm like, kind of glad about that. <laughs> a nice gift. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Especially as a photographer, it's, you know, I, I don't get models. I'd get normal people. And so I have to make normal people look as beautiful as possible. And, you know, sometimes I see people I'm like, oh man, they'd be so much fun to photograph. But now I'm starting to see like, 
maybe the story behind the wrinkles and the gray hair and the confusion and all that. And well, that's yet another lesson, right, that we mm -hmm. learn. Um, because as Alzheimer's can stretch over years, um, it, it means that, oh, guess what? Our life is passing by at the same time. <laughs> and we are also getting older and all of those things um, we get to experience at the very same time as Alzheimer's. It can be a lot. I, yeah, it can be a lot at times. Yeah, you said you went on this journey with your mom for 15 years. We've been on this for about 20. Wow. Yeah, and there's days when it's like, yeah, I'm kind of ready to be done. And then as regular listeners know, and this is September 17th, 2019, mom's had some physical health issues and we've been doing tests and stuff. And there's been times I'm like, well, wait, maybe I'm not ready. It's very interesting. Uh, mixed messages I'm sending myself, mm, mm -hmm. you know, but right now this afternoon, I'm totally ready to be done. <laughs> well, let's see. So if you have been doing this for 20 years now in some way, shape or form, let me ask you what your experience has been with asking for help. How are you doing with that? And, and what has been your experience through Alzheimer's and doing and asking for help from others? Well, my dad has been gone about two and a half years, just slightly over two and a half years. And he dealt with probably 90% of it. And we, well, again, this is a story I tell a lot because it illustrates the issues we dealt with very early on. We had a business together and my mother would take orders from clients with no directions, no due dates, no useful information of any sort. And in the beginning, it was easy to say, oh, well, she got distracted. You know, she was taking the order, phone rings, whatever, you know, stuff happens. But it happened more and more frequently. So I started quasi-supervising. If I heard her chatting along with a client, I would go out front and say, oh, hi. And so, oh, so what are we doing for Barbara today? And just kind of scoop in and try to get informed without being really obvious about it. Now her mom also had significant memory loss and it was either, in my opinion, as I like to say, my mail order MD was either undiagnosed Alzheimer's or it was the result of a brain aneurysm that she had had that she had for three months before they fixed it. Mm. And I've gotten mixed messages from doctors as to which way that was, but she ended up in the same condition as somebody with Alzheimer's. And so did my great grandmother. So it's not a really good family history. And my mom would make comments like, well, I don't want to end up like my mother. It'd be like, what do you want me to do? Murder is illegal. So my parents were about 20 miles away, about a half hour, 40 minute drive. And it got, as my dad's health was declining, I was trying to find ways to help that didn't significantly impact my schedule because you know yes i work from home and there's flexibility but i you know i can't flex to the point where i you know bend in half i got, i have to be flexible for clients too and sometimes mom's needs and business needs clash and that's really frustrating so i tried to help dad and he refused i you know he was diabetic he had all kinds of chronic health issues and i i think it was must have been 2013 or 14, 13. I, I don't even know what prompted it, but I started looking for an adult day program for her just because he would get so frustrated with her so quickly. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, he needs a lot more time away from her. He would, he re refused. It was like, I'm not interested. He made a bunch of excuses and I knew at the time they were excuses. It was clear across town. He had to, he would, oh, easy for me to say. He would have had to drive past several schools, including right. college. So getting there wouldn't have been super easy, but you know, it wasn't, wasn't the other side of the moon. So I mostly stressed about how, how am I going to help dad and not impact our life and have him, you know, allow me to help. And it, it never happened. He ended mm -hmm. up, he had a donated kidney that was failing and he ended up with his memory went backwards in time. About oh, wow. Yeah, that was a fun afternoon. Wow. And so then my sister and I and our two husbands 
you know, we just, we hit crisis mode, like, you know, red alert. Oh my God, what are we going to do? So I never got to just actually help. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of it's because dad never, he never asked. He never, he didn't accept it when I did try to help. And so it made it really easy to not try to continually to find ways to, to help. My sister did um, make, she would, she would make um, freezer meals that you could just put on the crock pot because he was a horrible cook. <laughs> Actually, that's kind of a compliment. He was a really horrible cook. <laughs> My mom did all of that for years, but after she got to the point where she was unable to, you know, process the steps to make a meal. Right. Which if anybody hasn't thought about how many steps are involved into making just a sandwich, something simple, the next time you make a sandwich, think about how many steps are involved. And if your brain is not functioning correctly, why eating is becomes a challenge. It's, it, it's interesting when you think about it in that way. So that was how my sister helped. And I don't know how, how she managed to make that happen. But she and my dad had a very different relationship than he and I did. So she probably right. just said, I'm doing this and you're accepting it. Right. That's how she is. And that's, if that's what worked, that was great. That's not how I am. So mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, yeah, you know, your, my help. your situation is so common. And it's, it, it was very much like that with me and my parents. You know, my mom had Alzheimer's. My dad was caring for mom and he wanted to do it a hundred percent himself. Um, so there were a few, you know, in thinking back now, there were a few little things that he let people help with. For example, there were ladies at church who would pick up my mom and take her to choir, pick her up to take her to quilting or to ladies circle. And um, he allowed that to go on because that's something that had happened long before the Alzheimer's came. And so he was comfortable letting that continue. But when it came time for me and my sister to try to intervene to try to um, be helpful, to be supportive of him. Um, it, it was a whole nother story, right? Um, so, so, so I'm, you know, this has always been top of mind for me is, because uh, I worked, like you mentioned, um, about the topic of adult day program. It took me three years, three years, to persuade my father to enroll my mother in adult day program. And in their little town, there was one. So it wasn't a lot of selection. There were a number of schools. It's crazy, the story is so much like yours. Um, there were a number of schools between their house, but it took so many years. And I would be talking with the lady from the adult day program. I called her like every, month or two and talked with her you know i tried to get her help and and her um, ideas as to how to get my dad to accept help so um you know i have developed a few i things that have helped um myself and others that i usually share with folks when i speak um and then i came across another great resource that i want to share with you today so um yeah so the, the one idea that I'll share with you that I came up with on my own and actually probably was the most effective thing I ever did was that I talked to, I reached out to some of my dad's best friends, the ones that I knew he was the closest to and whose advice he always took. And I invited them and we had a sit down breakfast and I had a heart to heart with them about everything that I was seeing with my mom, with my dad, the things that I felt really needed to improve, um, what needed to change. And um, I asked them to intervene on my behalf with my dad um, because I knew that he would take their advice. And so what that is kind of summing up is the fact that I think that there are some things that parents can't take advice from their kids about. That's probably very true. And so he responded, you know, it, it, it's different than it was instantly, but he was definitely more open to hearing these things from his friends than he was to hearing them from me. So, um, so that I had good, um, 
I had good results with. And as I share that with other people, I translate it. Maybe it's a, a priest or a pastor that is the one who influences your parent the most. Um, maybe it's their brother or sister um, or brother-in-law or just that, that special someone. It could be somebody from long past that they always would say, oh, you know what? Um, you know, that is the person that I always took their advice. You know, this, this could be the person um, that you can sit down with. And if they are at all involved in your parents' life currently, you may find that the conversation goes something like the conversation I had with my dad's friends, which were, oh, they said, we see all these things. We just didn't know what you were thinking about them. Or we were, you know, we see all these things. So that was a real eye opener for me. Um, and they were immediately on board with it. So that, that was a real um, blessing. You know, it's a little late for your family right now, but still something for your listeners to take into consideration and give it a try. It definitely. My first reaction when you were saying that his best friend would not have been useful. Okay. But my dad was a Rotarian for 45 years. Mm -hmm. My husband and I are Rotarians. So we have, well, had, it's hard to know how to clarify that one, mutual Rotarian friends. I'm not sure he would have taken their advice just because of his personality, but he definitely would have been better off if I had gone that route. Would have been a thousand percent worth trying. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a Rotarian. That's really, oh. that's really <laughs> funny. And uh, I know some of the Rotarians that I know that we are, especially for my club, we're a bunch of cut ups at my club. Um, and so, you know, maybe depending on their personality, you know, maybe, maybe they are the right person. Maybe somebody else is. Yeah. I would have had to probably search through the list, but they're, the one gentleman that comes to mind is he mostly retired real estate agent and he and my husband worked together when my husband started on that career. So it was kind of a crossover. Yes, he was my dad's friend and he's my dad's age, but he's also was close to us and you know, we still keep in contact with him. So that's the first person I would have gone to. Mm -hmm. And my dad might have listened to him. I might have had to tap a few other of the Rotarians, but like I said, his his best friend, his brother, I don't think that would have done me any good. <laughs> it's kind of different in every circumstance, you know. We all have that that special person that we trust, you know. So hopefully, if people could just get creative though and think about it, and it 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 could be an attorney, it could be a pastor, it you know, a doctor. It took my dad's doctor to convince my dad finally that my mom needed to go into memory care. Uh, my dad had gone for an annual physical for himself. And at six foot seven, he had weighed 200 pounds the previous year. And that year weighed in at 150 pounds. Oh my God. And that's when the doctor gave him the message. My doc, his doctor told him, listen, you know, your wife is counting on you to, you know, see her through, you know, she's, time is getting short for her. She needs you now more than ever. And she's counting on you to be a person for her. So we need you healthy. And in the only way that you're going to get healthy again is if you, Put her in the care of someone else and so that's that's how that decision was made but again it was someone else giving him that message because i tried <laughs> you know yeah you must have been really worried about that's really really skinny i was very worried that thanksgiving when he came to the house what i remember the most is that he had his belt cinched to like it was about oh i don't know eight or ten inches just beyond his waist you know beyond the buckle and I thought, where did all that extra belt come from? And then I realized, oh, that's where he used to be, you know? <laughs> yeah, because even at 200 pounds is pretty light for 6'7". That's right. Yeah, yes, exactly. So, oh. um, yeah. It's, I mean, we're, I think everybody who knows Alzheimer's knows that we're talking about really serious things. You know, the, it gets serious. And um, it gets frustrating for the adult child when we we see things that need to happen, but we can't figure out how to make them happen. And so my, that first idea is kind of an indirect way of getting them to happen. So 
Um, and then recently, I read this great book I'm going to recommend, and I can summarize it for you. Okay. Um, and I've also wrote a blog post on it, but it's called, let's see if I get it here, Reinforcements. And it's by a social psychologist named Heidi Grant. And um, so, I, you know, it's published by Harvard Business Re Review. So I think that definitely they saw this in terms of like it, when you're in the workplace and you need to get someone to collaborate with you and, you know, the win for them might not be obvious. I think that was the intention of this book. But, you know, after having lived Alzheimer's, as long as I've lived it, you know, because it was 15 years while mom was alive and now she's been gone for six years and I've been writing about it and speaking and, you know, ever since. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like you, you know, 21 years of my life and, you know, um, anyway, I kind of see things through the lens of Alzheimer's. So I started reading this book and um, it was really very fascinating to me. Um, she names five different ways that our human nature resists uh, resist asking for help. So she, you know, so this question, you know, that you kind of posed about your father, like we've yet to ever be able to get him to accept help. That's pretty normal because asking for help is so scary. It's really frightening. It goes against our nature in a bunch of different ways. Um, but the good news that uh, Heidi Grant gives in this book is that when we finally do ask for help and we overcome those fears and ask, that people are usually twice as likely to help us than we think they're going to be. So, um, so there's some good news there for those of us who are willing to take the risk, you know, <laughs> sit down and have breakfast with dad's good friends or approach that pastor and ask for his help or whatever, that often people are going to be much more willing to help us than we think they are. It's also helpful to remember the very unfortunate statistic that 65% of caregivers are either hospitalized or pass away before the person they're caring for. That's a oh. really horrible thing. And they, I have not seen how much, what the percentage is hospitalized versus the percentage that pass away first. Mm -hmm. Cause 65% is a huge number. Huge. Um, but I'm assuming that a lot of them end up hospitalized. And some of the issues that I've been doing, dealing with my mom over the last couple of months, there was one day I was so frustrated with the medical profession. I, I forgot that I had learned that losing my cool is not usually beneficial. Mm -hmm. and they pushed my buttons to a 15 and I was driving to get my mom and I talked to my husband and I said, I understand why my dad did what he did. Because basically he needed to be on dialysis, which he did not want to do, which was fine. Mm -hmm. I understood that, but he didn't tell anybody. And I now realize that he was having significant cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. and she was so much worse that it was, it, the signs were completely missed by everybody until the very end. And I just, I told my husband, like, now I understand why my dad essentially self-terminated because he just gave up because he mm -hmm. could deal. I don't think he could deal with what I've had to deal with the last two years. <sighs> you know, and I think if you ask for help and you get help, and you understand, and this is one of the things that makes me really crazy is people, even, you know, caregivers like myself for parents and you, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to keep mom at home for, you know, forever. It's like, you're just asking for trouble. You know, it's a 24 seven job. I know people that didn't, haven't slept for a week because of issues with their parents. Yes. You know, I, it's, it's easy to go down that rabbit hole when they're, you know, when it's, and you just have to remind them what you're doing once or twice, or we're, we're going to have dinner now, come sit here. Oh, okay. But when you have to remind them every 10 seconds, what you're doing. <laughs> and, and we know that it gets to that, right? Mm -hmm. you know, That's we where we're at. It, yeah. We know it's, it's getting there. And so, you know, a big part is um, coming to that point of acceptance of the reality of the situation. And I have to say that you know, now that this is all over, at least with my mom in my life, 
our story with Alzheimer's has ended there. Um, I still realize now to this day that there are still things that I've yet to fully accept about what happened. <laughs> you know, there are still days where I will hear somebody speak or I'll read an article and I'll think, oh, is that what was going on? Or, you know, um, because it's a very intense um, period of time, right? Um, so what I, what I wrote a blog post kind of summarizing some of the key points of this book. And what I was arguing for, or at least asking people to consider, is that maybe there's a way that we as adult children can step in and build a little uh, help network for our parents be, you know, without them saying yes, right? <laughs> so when we as adult children are, are, you know, saying, hey, let me bring food, let me clean your house, let me do this, and dad is like, no, no, no. But maybe there's a way for us to, um, you know, get neighbors involved and get others involved where we can kind of, that could be the thing that we do to support dad is to, to kind of put together some volunteers, maybe people he likes and knows better than us, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe he likes those Rotarians and rather have them around. That's, you know, and they were, well, the neighbors, my parents had neighbors on one side that had been there for years. And I think they would have been more than willing to help out with some things. And they also had, you know, a, a landscaper that took care, you know, the company took care of the yard, but they'd had that guy for years and years. Now he's my guy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I co-opted him for my yard and I could, he, the landscaper, the owner of the company has helped the people that are renting my parents' house because that's the kind of guy he is. And my dad might have accepted, um, I don't want to say help. He might have paid Jose to take mm -hmm. care of other things if Jose had known to ask. So it, this is where I would have had to get involved and I didn't know Jose at the time. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> And they did have yeah. housekeepers, but they somehow disappeared. I think because my dad forgot to pay them or he got upset with them over something stupid and they, they quit. Right, which sounds more likely. Either one, I'm not, yeah. you know, cause the day that we showed up and my dad thought it was about 1998, you know, the, the house wasn't clean, it was dusty. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what happened to their housekeepers? And you know, my mom's nails were just like a mile long. I'm like, I know she goes and gets her nails done every, you know, every four, two or three weeks. So like what happened, it was like all these things, like that's the signs that I hadn't noticed before, mm -hmm. but we were worried about what was going on with my dad. So all that other stuff was definitely not a priority. And then, you know, he was in the hospital for a month. He was home for a week. He fell because he refused to let the caregivers help him. Yes. <laughs> and he ended up at a different hospital. And my husband, we were having breakfast one morning and he said, well, I wonder how many times dad's going to end up in the hospital like this before he dies. And I just looked up and I said, oh no, we're not doing this anymore. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a decision. And I knew what his advanced directive was. So it wasn't like I had decided he needed to be on hospice. It was more like, um, if we're going to keep going down this path, this is not what he wants. So we need to be respectful of what he wants. And mm -hmm. it was still a tough decision to sign the paperwork for hospice. I had a dog that was had cancer and she was at the end of her life. And we were trying to figure out at what point we were going to deal with her. If you know what I mean? It was like, yes. it was not a good time. Cause I felt like I was kind of like deciding, okay, well we're, trying to decide at what point we're going to put the dog to sleep. And now I'm kind of doing the same thing with my dad and the hospice people are like, no, 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 it's not the same. And I'm like, yeah, it feels the same. <laughs> mm. Well, the, you know, your story just so much illustrates this whole point that, you know, your life is going to go on while you're living Alzheimer's, all the other aspects of your life. I, I'm just going to take a quick point here and just show you, um, this is patterns in time. This is the piece that I put together. Um, after my mom passed, I was tormenting myself so much after she passed, asking myself questions like, how did I not see that coming? How did things happen that I completely missed? I couldn't, after she passed, I had yet to ever like keep a record of, well, this happened this day. I'd yet to ever keep a diary. 
So I, you know, I, there were, I had all these memories of different days and things that happened, but I had no idea like when, you know, chronologically how they all unfolded and stuff. So I took all of her medical records, um, all of the notes that I had taken, um, which were kind of random and messy and, and all, and I combined it all and created a timeline. That's what's on these purple pages here at the bottom where I created a timeline of my mom's um, Alzheimer's from the day that she, from the year she was diagnosed all the way until when she passed. And then even what happened with my dad and me in terms of our health and well-being after she passed. Um, just as a reference so that other people could look at it and say, you know, um, okay, mom is um, following dad right now, right? He's, she's shadowing him. What might happen next? what might happen next, just so that other adult children could have something to look at so that you would know what are the things that are coming. We all know with Alzheimer's that it's going to unfold at a different speed in different ways for everybody. But, um, uh, so that's, you know, was the purpose of this. And then I created, um, I identified all the different things that mom used to be able to do to care for herself and charted out how over time they shifted to my dad for his responsibility, which again happens, it's it's Alzheimer's, um, and so this has been a big help. I, I've I, a number of people have uh, reached back out to me and told me, you know, I had that they had yet to ever understand why this was so taxing on the care partner. Right? We understand that your wife has Alzheimer's, but really, how is that affecting you every day? And this part really breaks it down into each of the activities of daily living, like bathing, getting dressed, and shows how over time, they each became separate things that my mom was now unable to do and that my dad needed to do for her. And then um, on the last page, I summarize all the different ways that after trial and error, the ways that uh, I was able to help dad and support him. Because what became really quickly, quick to identify was that my dad was going to take good care of my mom. If I could take better care of him, that would be a good thing. And so this is, these are all the different things that we did to support him. So this is, um, uh, and, and I managed to sum it all up in, I think it's 38 inches. <laughs> so it looks so, like it's a, 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 a reference, reference piece uh, for other family members, because I know during Alzheimer's, I was awfully busy. There's a lot of beautiful novels and books out there and memoirs written about Alzheimer's. But I know I was way too busy to read during that time. So that's part of why I put what I learned in this type of a format quick reference which is excellent because i am a reader but in the last three years since we started you know, it's been almost three years since the nightmare with my dad started i find that i read news articles i'm really big on the news app on my ipad and guests send me their books all the time and i try really hard to read them but there are days when it's like i just cannot do any more Alzheimer's anything mm -hmm. it's really getting harder because like I go see mom on Mondays and one of her physical issues is she's got a growth next to one kidney and mm. now they want me to do a third ultrasound it's like ugh, they don't understand the how involved it is just to get her there right and I've tried to explain it to them and they don't get it and that's really frustrating but what's happening, and I messaged the doctor before we started talking, because of course they want me to do a couple other tests too that I've basically been talked into, but it's mostly so we can have information, like concrete information, so we know what we're not going to deal with going forward. Instead of assuming we're not dealing with, you know, makes, she might have a, a tumor and we're not treating that, but we're not sure if it's a tumor or a cyst. So they want a biopsy, which requires anesthesia, which I'm not super interested in doing it on somebody with advanced Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But the neurologist even said, I've had like three people say, it would really be helpful to know exactly what the problem is before you make a decision not to go forward. I'm like, well, it's kind of hard to argue with. But this growth next to her kidney, I don't know if it's her brain or the growth or both, but she's having a miscommunication on when she needs to go. I see. And 
every time I've showed up in the last month to spend time with her, take her to the doctor, whatever we're doing, she's in her room. She is not completely dressed. She is very stressed about being wet when she's not. Mm -hmm. And she can't seem to function getting in and out of her clothes. And it's like, yeah, that's what I want to deal with. <laughs> I've been here 35 seconds with you. And the stress level has just gone to almost not a 10, but maybe a seven. And it's exhausting. It's like, mm -hmm. I've been here five minutes and I'm ready to leave because I can't fix you. I can't really help you. And she fights the help. That's my, the biggest frustration is she doesn't know she has a problem. Mm -hmm. She doesn't realize that she needs help. So when you try to give her help, she resists. And so I try to let her struggle through and then she gets frustrated, which of course, you know, now her stress level is higher. So you kind of have to figure out when to dive in and help and when to stand back and say, you know, both feet in different holes. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, back to your, your point about that she doesn't know that there's a problem, but I almost want to challenge you on that because you first said that she's kind of worried that she's wet and she's not, or she's about to be and stuff. And, and that's kind of a natural uh, modesty impulse, isn't it? In taking care of ourselves that we all want to, you know, make sure that we pre preserve our dignity and all. And it's, pro it's probably highly agitating for her to be so confused and not, and, and, and also to feel like, you know, now everybody knows, right? Um, so I can picture the two of you just going through that. That has got to be quite a time. And it's every time I go now, which is, I guess I should just like take a deep breath and just mm -hmm. know when I knock on the door, she's going to open it in some form. Usually she has a shirt and, you know, the top half of her is dressed, but the bottom mm -hmm. half is in various stages of undress. And she'll open the door and be like, oh, thank God. Oh, and it's just, it's just like. Right, because at least she trusts you to help her out in that situation. Which is interesting because she tells people I'm her best friend. So. That's well, right. that's lovely, right? Um, you know, when people have Alzheimer's, they may lose their accuracy in terms of the exact details or the exact specifics that they tell people, but they do speak from the heart. And um, if she's speaking from the heart and telling people that you're her best friend and that she is welcoming you and your support during those situations, that's a that's a flat, very flattering thing. You should you should you know take a breath and realize what a beautiful thing you're doing for your mom just by being there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate hearing that, especially today. Like I said, I'm really really frustrated with her today. And I bet she, it sounds like she's kind of frustrated with herself too, right? I, that she would rather this be different and it's beyond her to know how to fix it. Um, yeah. So I bet, I bet you're both kind of in the same boat. Yeah. In the last, last week when I visited, I don't remember about the clothing at this point. So at least I blocked some of that out. We went and sat in the courtyard of the memory care, which is a really beautiful place. And it was peaceful and just, oh, it was so nice. And she kept telling me she, she's at the stage in Alzheimer's where she uses the wrong words a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's actually gotten significantly worse in the past month where she used to kind of realize, wait, that doesn't seem like the right word. Now it's just, she strings words together and they sound like they would make sense, but they make no sense. Mm -hmm. And she at one point said, she'd said a couple times, well, my brain doesn't work so well anymore. And it's like, yeah, you think? And at one point she says, well, my brain must just be dying. And I thought, whoa, that's kind of almost scary. Kind of, she's never said that before. And I thought, mm -hmm. hmm, how, how much awareness is behind that statement? Right. Isn't, isn't that something? Yeah. And it, you know, and of course that's a little stressful too, because you think, you know, is she really aware that, you know, she's this far gone memory wise, mentally? Really? She must be for her to say something like that. Um, 
That's, that's really remarkable. It's the first time I've ever heard her make the comment, my brain is dying. Uh-huh. She's always made the comment, well, my brain doesn't work so well anymore. Something along those lines, which is something we might all say, like, occasionally if I'm really tired, I'll be like, oh, I'm really tired, so my brain's not working very well. Mm -hmm. You can kind of almost hear my mom saying that. Right. I know what I'm saying. I don't know if she does, but yeah, it's it's really hard. One of the things I've I've realized recently is I've always known that I'm a stress eater, but I'm I'm usually aware when if I'm starting to get stressed and my brain's going, hey, how about some chocolate? <laughs> it's yeah. starts yakking at me about you know, mm, doesn't that smell good? Whatever food must be in the last mile that I can smell. You know, my, it's just constantly telling me, you know, oh, let's eat, let's eat, let's eat. I have realized now when I visit my mom, there's a reason why I'm starving halfway through the visit. And it's not because I'm actually hungry. It's because it's just so mentally exhausting and stressful that my brain is like, let's have some food. <laughs> now I'm having to be aware of that because I don't want to gain a whole bunch of weight. I lost a ton of weight a few years ago and I've kept most of it off. 20 of it needs to go away again. And I don't need to stress eat into now 30 of it needs to go away. So it's, that's kind of been an interesting self-realization. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had to deal with my mom every day, I would probably weigh significantly more than I do because I'd probably be eating all the time. Mm -hmm. Because one, it's soothing. And it's like yesterday, she, she told me she hadn't eaten all day. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> I know they feed you quite well where she lives and the food is actually really good. I've eaten with her many times. It's probably about time to actually have a meal meal with her again to see how she's functioning meal wise. She doesn't seem to have problems eating. Mm -hmm. It's the dressing, showering, all the personal stuff that's, that we don't really want somebody to help us with that she needs help with. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it will be a good idea for you to just go again because things change over time and um, just to get so that you're current as to what sh her abilities are. Right. Um, I know she would appreciate that extra time with you. So that's that would be a really good idea. Um, and, you know, if it's at all helpful, you know, since I'm see since at least right now in my life, I see Alzheimer's in the rear view mirror. One of the things I can say is that um, my mom lost the ability to speak. Like I, there were, I think the last two or maybe even three years that she was alive, she could, she lost the ability to put words together in any way, right way words, otherwise. So it, I, I would. You know, I, I would love to go back to that time where my mom could put any words together and make a sentence, you know, and there may be come a time where you're going to look back on today and say, wow, that was a great day. Um, uh, so, so, you know, if that's at all helpful, um, that's, that's how Alzheimer's works, right? It's going to keep taking and taking and taking and, um, uh, you know, the more that you can look at today, whatever her abilities are and be really grateful for it, that's a great day, you know? And if she could talk and use whatever words, that's, that's a good thing, so. She just gets very frustrated when she'll make, she, well, yesterday was very interesting. She had an accident, which is the first um, issue with incontinence a significant issue anyway and so the you know the staff was letting me know that this is what happened and i don't know who she was upset with but she just kept referring to that you know pardon me gang that bitch and she was like rah, 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 just and i kept saying well who's upsetting you who's causing trouble let me, you know point them out to me and I'll, I'll fix it. And it, she had no idea what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she'll say something and you can figure out what she's, what she means because she uses enough of the right words that you can at least make a pretty good guess. But sometimes she'll make a statement and it's like, what in the heck? And, right. you know, so I will say, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't understand that. Can, can you explain that? 
you know, or can you say that again? And man, she just gets really fed up with you when you ask that question. But try yeah. not to ask that one. So I don't object to sitting in companionable silence in the courtyard or because we had the neurology appointment yesterday and I don't know why the neurologist is always an hour late, but I knew that they, she would be. And so when I checked mom in, we ended up there extra early. <laughs> not that that was a benefit. And I said, you know, I know we're early. And I said, I understand that the doctor is usually running behind. And they're like, oh yeah, she's like 15 or 20 minutes behind. And I said, terrific. Mom doesn't wait patiently. We're going across the parking lot and get something to drink. And they were great because they said, we'll come back in X, Y, Z time. And I'm thinking, okay, that's not, you know, I was like, that's still going to put us here significantly early for the doctor. And she goes, if I need you to come back sooner, I'll call you. And she did. And we were already halfway across the parking lot and it worked out great. So that was nice because you know, my, you know, nobody wants to sit in the doctor's office and mom certainly doesn't. And we just sat there at the little hamburger restaurant drinking, you know, she's a huge Diet Coke fan, but does not get that where she lives. So mm -hmm. I treated her to that and I had an iced tea. I tried to ask her, she wanted a snack and she's like, well, I'll just whatever you want. And I'm like, no, no, no. What? Like, what do you want? I said, I'm not hungry. Do you want something to eat? And I just get, I get all this hand motion, <laughs> whatever you want. I'm like, it's not about me. <laughs> right. So she's very, you know, she's always trying to take care of you and help you and do whatever you want. Cause it's just easier than making a decision. And sometimes I just have to be like, fine. If she doesn't want to make a decision. If she was hungry, she'd tell me. That's right. You know, and it's That's sometimes right. you would know, you would know. I, it would be super clear to you. You would know. And I figured it was probably two hours since she had lunch. So I'm thinking, yeah, probably not hungry. I mean, she doesn't need French fries or any of this junk food that's here anyway. None of us need it. So we'll just have our drinks and we'll wait for the doctor. And she kept telling me how nice the place was and how big it was, even though it wasn't. And I just, I try to look at it through her eyes. I'm like, yeah, it's right. a pretty nice little restaurant. And it reminded me of one that was around the corner from our first home. And so it's, that's kind of where I try to go mentally is, you know, try to find the, the little bit of sunshine in all that darkness that is just her constant repeating the same words. And, oh. mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and um, the other thing, especially when there's anger or she's reacting to something, but the words are not giving you information, um, you know, instead reading her emotions, you know, if her emotions are um, fear or if her emotions are anger, then she needs a different response from you. So if she is um, worried or afraid of something, then she needs comforting. Whatever words she's using to describe it, she needs somebody to comfort her maybe with a hug or a pat on the hand or um, something reassurance. Um, if she's angry, she might need, you know, somebody to listen or somebody to at least validate that, yes, you know, something frustrating happened or, you know, so um, that's something else to think about is to start listening more to her emotions and less to the wor exact words that she's saying, especially as the words are starting to become like jumbled. What was interesting yesterday, because after I said, well, who's, who's upsetting you? And, you know, who, who, who did that to you? And it, she just kept kind of not ranting. It was like low key ranting, if that makes any sense. And I had already been told that she'd had the accident in the dining room. And so I thought, I think the person she's mad at is herself. She just mm -hmm. isn't, you know, it's like her mind isn't going that way. And so right. she can't verbalize it. And once we left to go to the doctor, she forgot, I think she might have said yeah. a couple couple of more things about that particular person being upsetting. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because the, you know, the staff's like, we can't believe that she was saying that. And I'm like, you guys don't know what my mom was like because <laughs> you didn't mess with my mother. You know, she right. didn't talk potty mouth. Not that bitch is that bad a word. You know, she didn't use really bad ones, but that one she would have used, but she just caught them so off guard. It was funny. And I'm just laughing because I'm like, oh, you did not mess with my mother. She was fine. 
But if you crossed the line with her, you were going to know it. And you were going to be looking for where the heck that line is so that you could back up over it again. <laughs> and they were like, oh, that's really interesting to know because they were just shocked that she was just ranting and raving about this B-I-T-C-H that had upset her. They had no idea who she was talking about. But I think it was her. Mm -hmm. I was I was very glad that I got the, we had an accident. And this is how we handled it. And I forgot to ask them why, if she had been wearing the pull-ups, whatever we want to call the grown-up version, or if she had resisted that. I think next week I'll just take home all the regular underwear. So I knew, I'm like, I'm pretty sure she's talking about herself. Mm -hmm. so that was kind of helpful. I was in the right frame of mind to figure that one out. But I also knew if I just kind of gently asked, like, you know, I'll take care of whoever messed with you. Right. There you go. Take her side. Oh, yeah. Because the, isn't that what, what you would want? You know, if you were mad, wouldn't you want me to say, that's right. Let's us two. We'll, I'll, I'll stand with you. We'll go get them. You yeah, know? we'll go beat them up for you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I got your back. You know, that, and that's the you know, she wants the same thing, I think, um, which is that feeling that somebody's got her back. And, you know, boy, when I think about the person who aggravates me most, it's me. <laughs> so I can understand your mom feeling that way. Yeah. Well, it just was interesting because she could not articulate a separate person. It was just this mm -hmm. amorphous yeah. person that had upset her. But I'm like, I said, well, do you want to point her out to me? And she just kept blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like, it was almost humorous. And then, you know, I helped her get the bottom half of her clothing back on. And I said, oh, hey, let's, let's, let's go out. Let's get Change away from the scenery. Place. Yes. I mean, let's... I knew we were, we were going to the doctor. One of the biggest challenges, when, and it's always when she, we can go out and watch kids. I don't get this statement. If she realizes I'm taking her to an appointment that's not fun, mm -hmm. I get the, what in the hell is the matter with my husband? Why is he? It is not your responsibility. Right, 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 right. I'm like, oh my God. Like, I just say, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> there you go. What does yeah. she say? She usually stops or she'll just keep ranting. But it, I, if I say, I don't know, you tell me two or three times, it usually just cuts it off eventually. Uh huh. You know, because yeah. she'd be like, well, what's the matter with my husband? I'd say, well, don't you remember he had eye surgery so he doesn't drive anymore? And the day she told me, she just looked at me and she goes, oh, that's, and she, I say, I'm saying BS because it's supposed to be a clean podcast, but she used the full words. And I thought, I'm not saying that anymore. <laughs> it's like, he doesn't drive you anywhere because he's been dead for two and a half years. I'm not telling her that. Well, either. you're giving much better answers. You're yeah. giving much better answers, right? Because we know that repeating the fact that he's dead is not going to help her. It's not going to convince her otherwise. It's not going to comfort her. Nope. So the answers that you're giving her are absolutely the right one. I um, once taught a, um, a family, I, I led uh, an evening at a assisted living where we had all the family members there. And this one son was telling me that his mother had a hard time uh, uh, remembering that the father had passed. And he was so insistent that she get the exact, you know, that she understand that and embrace that that he went to the graveyard and photographed the tombstone and brought the photograph to his mom. And, um, you know, and I looked at the director of the facility and she looked at me, you know, and we were, I mean, just shook our heads in amazement. We were trying to persuade him that, you know, a much better approach is to change the subject, is to start talking about how much we all love dad, right? Um, there's a number of different ways that you can get creative and lead that discussion in, in, in a different direction. But the specific facts about his passing and when that happened and that he's gone, it only makes her relive that. And it's, there's no benefit to it. It's, it's just too much on her. She doesn't need to relive that much better that you instead start to reminisce about his good qualities or otherwise, right? Some favorite Which, stories or things you used to laugh about or what he liked to eat or, you know, you name anything. Um, and if you could get the conversation going in that direction, you're in much better shape, right? So good for you. Well, there's times when she, you know, gets on that topic 
And there was one day she was just, she was literally complaining about him. And I thought, you know, okay, he wasn't, he was not an angel. He was not a perfect person. None of us are, you know, he put up with a lot of crap and he did as best he could for all of us. You know, that's all we can ask of ourselves and our family members. And she was just going, rah, 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 rah. and I, I forgot exactly what the, the strain of complaint was, but I said, well, we, we had gone out someplace and she was ranting and raving how, why, why didn't he not come along? And I'm like, do you really think he wants to come to the fabric store with us? Oh, there please. You go. <laughs> and she just looks at me and she goes, yeah, probably not. And I'm thinking, yeah, no kidding. There that you go. Not even. Perfect. Yeah. I'm like, you know, so it's just, I try to talk to her about him the way we might've when he was alive, which is right. a challenge because it's like, yeah, it'd be kind of nice to just maybe reminisce about his good qualities instead of the negative ones. Yep. But, yeah. You know, apparently the negative ones are what have stuck. You know, maybe I'll try, I might have to try to see if I could pivot it to something positive. I just usually try to. Or try to joke. I mean, I think you're doing a good job turning it into a joke. Like, you know, he wouldn't like the fabric store anyway. He always would have complained about, you know, or uh-huh. something, you know, and, and then just make her laugh. She'd be like, yeah, you're right. You know, yeah, we went. Good- we went to the girls day, you know, gir- we you know, went to the pool and watched kids and she was griping that, you know, he should have taken us like the last time I rode in the car with him driving was horrifyingly scary. He must um, miss him. Something, you know, sometimes. that he talks about him so much. Yeah, I'm sure. And it, what's interesting is a little over a year ago, we had to rehome her dog that the uh-huh. memory care let her have. The dog was almost double her weight, which Oof. is terrible. And my poor sister and I were like, we were trying to find that magic clue where the benefit of having the dog was less than the, what was becoming almost like dog abuse. Like we could not mm-hmm. get the other residents to not feed her. I mean, it was just, we, we lost that battle. I'm sure the dog was like, ha, 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 I win. <laughs> Cause she knew how to get food from all of the other old sure. ladies. And they were renovating the entire complex and because the dog did not have structure, she was getting kind of wild and crazy. And there was one day mom and I came back from whatever we were doing. I let her out in the courtyard. She ran, I don't know how the dog managed to run, ran circles around the courtyard looking for my mom. My mom was in the bathroom. I'm like, dog, it's 110 degrees out here. And she's a black poodle that, like I said, she weighed twice what she should have. Like, if you're not going to go pee, we're going back in. Open the door. The caregiver's like, oh, hey, there's Misty. And Misty just laked on the floor. And I'm like, oh, dear. I was so embarrassed. And they're just like, oh, that's Misty. And I'm like, ew, that's really gross. So when the executive director of the entire residence he never told me we had to rehome her. He just kind of beat around the bush. And I'm like, fine, I get the message. <laughs> so it was, it was nice that he took that decision out of our hands because, yeah. you know, it was hard to know. Is the dog being a comfort to mom or is she just an annoyance? Because there were times she was annoying to mom and it was hard to know, like, we're not there at night. You know, is, is the dog giving mom comfort at night? Right. I don't think the dog was that comforting because my mom stresses about that dog still and it's been 13 months since we rehomed her. Right, right, right. You know, she's always like, well, my dog is around here somewhere. And I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> and she doesn't realize that my dad's gone. So she's like, well, she must be with my husband. Yeah, that's where she's at. Whatever. Perfect. Yeah. It's it's like, like, yes, just agree with her. Yeah, my husband went and picked her up and said, oh, I'm taking Misty to the groomers. And right. Misty never came back. Yeah. She doesn't, you know, and I was a little concerned, but yeah, no, it's it's much better to try to be with them where they're at, which is really hard. Right. There's times when it's like, okay, we're just sitting here watching children. I got 15 things to do at home today and another 25 tomorrow. <laughs> really got right. stuff to do. I really don't need to sit here at the pool and watch the kids, but it makes her well, happy. It's a beautiful thing. I'm sure your mom gets a lot of enjoyment out of that. It's stimulation for her, right? So think of it that way. Think of that like as a mental exercise for your mom to engage with people in whatever way, whether if she, 
is unable to talk to them, at least she can watch and laugh and enjoy that. It's a, it's a really healthy thing that you're doing. And, um, you know, the day will come where you're going to cherish every minute and wish you had another afternoon to spend at the pool with her. So try yeah. to try to just keep a list of the things, those other things, which I know are, are uh, on your mind because it's only natural. But honestly, um, you know, that day is a gift that you have to, to be with her. And, um, you know, you're you're being present with her, you know, yeah. <laughs> with her attention in your heart is what she really needs. Um, well, and I, then find, I find that when we've been outside at, at the park or the pool, out in the sunshine, out in nature, and it's, it's, I don't think anybody else would notice it, but there just seems to be just this little tiny bit more clarity. I mean, that's, that's almost the wrong word, but it, it's like, there's just like a little spark that's not there when she's just in the memory residence. Mm -hmm. You sit out in the courtyard. I felt so guilty last week because my husband and I had been at a conference and we got in at one o'clock in the morning. So this is like 13 hours later, I'm sitting with her in the courtyard and she's like, oh, where are you taking me today? And I was like, oh, <laughs> shoot, I wasn't going to take you anywhere. <laughs> And I'm like, she's never asked me that. And I'm like, well, let's go sit in the courtyard. It's such a beautiful day. And I said, it's supposed to be really hot later this week. And, you know, and she did, she kept saying, oh, how nice it was out there. And, you know, it's basically a big rectangle in the middle of the, the buildings. And you could see the trees on the other side of the roof. And they were blowing pretty hard in the wind, but we were protected. It was just really nice. She fell asleep for a few minutes. I fell asleep. And then I woke up with a, I'm like startled myself awake and I'm like, oh crap, she's gone. And then I looked at my watch, I'm like, oh, she's probably in there having dinner. So I'm, just gonna go. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what she was thinking when she just abandoned me out here. <laughs> she probably thought you were sleeping so peacefully. Yeah, she probably didn't want to disturb me. I'm what a nice she, mom. <laughs> I, I was a little surprised she didn't wake me up for dinner. Yeah. But, you know, I was like okay, that's interesting. And yesterday, I don't know, she must have been really fed up with me or something after the doctor. Because we walk in, I was letting the caregiver know what had transpired at the neurologist. And she just walks down the hall and just like abandons me. I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> but she also doesn't normally do. Usually she's like right there. And if I'm not, if I'm engaging with somebody else and not her, she don't, she doesn't get offended, but it's, you can tell that she's like, hello, I'm here too. Mm hmm she always wants me to stay and have dinner with her. So I might have to do that maybe in a couple of weeks. I always go after rotary. So whenever we don't have a rotary meeting, I have lunch with her. So I'll have to do that in the residence this next time. Now that the weather's starting to not be so great, still Northern California. We had rain yesterday. That's pretty weird. Um, it's easier to eat with her there when it's not nice outside. I try to take her out. As long as the weather is decent, we go out. But now I'm going to have to go back to the to the library during kids' hour and the fabric store. <laughs> nice. That's really nice. You're giving her great stimulation. And it were it's and then I don't have to deal with the other residents because they all think I work there too. <laughs> I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Yeah, there's one gal that she's always like, nurse, nurse. I'm like. <laughs> I can't convince her I don't work there, so I try to help. <laughs> so that just reinforces that I'm there to help. Oh, what does your quote say? I can't. Oh, read I was it. yeah, I was just uh, checking this quote because I wanted to be sure to mention this, right? So um, when we ask people for help, um, there's always that concern, right? That oh, if I ask you for help, that you might, you know, start to resent me or or whatever. And actually, the research done by the social psychologist. Heidi Grant finds that helpers tend to like the people that they help more, not less after helping them. So that's something to remember too, that when we ask people to help us, we're giving them a chance to do something that they think is important, right? They, they want to, people want to be helpful and they want to show up for their friends and people they care about and neighbors because it's who they are. And they actually will like you more if you give them the chance to help you. So just something else to think about. Now that's a really good 
good thing to think about. And I did not realize that, but we, everybody likes to have a purpose. And when they can see that you have a need and they can't figure out how to help you or give you their purpose, which I'm not sure that's quite the right grammar, but hopefully everybody's getting that direction. I think it frustrates them and they're like, well, I can't help her. So I, I think they involuntarily kind of start taking steps back from you because they're frustrated. It's like, I want to help Jennifer. I want to help Barbara. They don't, they're not asking for it. They're not accepting it. So I'm just, I'm just going to stand back here and wait till they ask. Right. You know, I can That's see right. And, and, and you need to let people know in, in very clear terms that you need help and that you're willing to accept help. Um, and when you do that very clearly, then people are much more e uh, eager to say yes when you ask them. But you have to persuade them and that you also need to persuade them that they are the ones that you need help from, right? That they specifically. So I, you know, I liken that to like an email where if you send an email out to 40 people, it's easy for nobody to think that it's their job to answer it. But if you send it to one person and you say, I need you to do X, it's a lot easier to see that, oh, that's my responsibility now. Um, and so, but if, if the people that you're asking for help get that message, um, then it, it can make all the difference. I believe it. And then I interviewed, this has been almost a year ago, the episode, there's two of them because we talked so long, called The Caring Committee. And it was another podcaster whose grandmother had recently passed from Alzheimer's and their family, his grandfather had been taking care of grandma and he threw up the white flags and said, I can't do this anymore. And he was talking to his kids, this mm -hmm. guy's mom and her siblings and said, you need to, you need to research care homes. I can't do this anymore. So that's what they did. But this family, and I've talked about them quite a bit, not as much recently, they all came together and they literally, this is what they called it. They called it the committee and they all said, okay, what do you feel that you can do? What are you comfortable with doing? And like, I cannot stand calling insurance companies. If I got to call and talk to people that are going to tell me what well, our policy is, or, well, can I please speak to Diane? No, you cannot speak to Diane because all she's going to give you is a bunch of gibberish. So that's why you're talking to me. I get I go from zero to super irritated really quickly. And so it's much better if somebody else does that. It's right, and odds are there is somebody else on your committee who can do that and who might even enjoy doing that. Yeah, they'd be like, I think they had people that dealt with the legal paperwork, you know, insurance and all mm -hmm. that stuff, which I can do, but ugh, I'd rather not. And not everybody was in the same town. So some people would make phone calls, even though they weren't local, or mm -hmm. they dealt with all the, the headache paperwork, you know, because they weren't there to do hands on. And so you can also do that with non family. Mm -hmm. say, Absolutely. You know, you're, you're a retired attorney. Can you help me puzzle through this paperwork? Sometimes if you ask for a specific, you know, help in a specific way that you, kind of tailored to them it'd be harder right. to know and then not make it open-ended like can you just help me with this all the time <laughs> exactly right so it's a lot easier to get help you know get somebody to make dinner for you on thursday next week than it is to get somebody to make dinner for you every thursday or every week right mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or every day so yes this more specific you are in your requests the more more likely you are to get yeses. And then you also have to be, if you're the person asking for help, you have to be willing to accept what help you're offered. So you may be asking for X and someone may offer you Y. Be a little bit flexible, use your creativity and try to figure out a way to say yes to that, whatever it is that they're offering. And you have to take what you're given, right? At the end of the day. So, um, and sometimes that's okay. It helps you think about a different approach to the um, to the answer that you wanted to provide. So it can be it can be helpful. And if they're willing to help you, you have to accept how they're going to do it. That's right. That's exactly right. That would be harder for me because I'm kind of very very specific. I like things in a very specific way. So you have to let go of that. I get that. Um, 
or just be or be um, really selective about the things that you ask for help, right? Maybe you only ask for help on the things that you're less concerned about exactly, right? You know, so you might be like super concerned about every pot being in a certain place in the kitchen, but you're okay with um, washing the blue towels with the gray towels. Why then you might ask someone for help with the laundry, but not with the kitchen, if you get my metaphor. Yeah. yeah. Well, and too, there's some things where it's like, if somebody's helping you and they put all the pots away wrong, just rearrange them later when they're gone. It's not a big mm -hmm. deal. <laughs> Yeah, if you could tolerate that, and if, yeah. It's, well, the one thing that I know from, like you were saying earlier that your mom had friends that still took her to church and quilting and all that. My mom had the same thing. She was a seroptimist, and she had two friends that would pick her up and take her to the meetings, and one friend who was notoriously always late for everything would frustrate my dad because she'd say, well, I'm going to, I got errands to do. I'm just going to take Diane with me when I do these errands. Why the hell this woman took my mother to places like Costco? Mm -hmm. I did not know, but Hey, if it didn't kill her brain, I could not take my mom to Costco. There Any place go. that's that big and confusing is just, no, it's not a good idea, but she was never sure when she'd get back. And my dad would get so frustrated. I, I told him once I said, tell her, you're taking Diane out. You're going to do errands. Great. I'm going to go do blah, blah, blah. And I will be back at four. So if you're going to be back before four, I need to know. If right. you're going to be back after four, as long as you're back by five, so I know when to throw dinner in the crock pot or whatever, you know, it's just, he did not communicate with her why it was frustrating. And right. I don't think she cared. It was like, I'm doing you a favor, cope. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the impression that I got from the conversations, but I, I do, they talked about visiting mom after we moved her to the memory care. And I don't think any of them did because I think it's scary. It's like this, I knew this lady when she was sharp and now mm -hmm. it's like, she's not. And I think it's, it's kind of scary if you don't, if you're not educated on what to expect and how to deal with it, like, you know, please don't remind her or that her husband's dead because that's not going to do anybody any favors mm -hmm. or the dog was rehomed or whatever. You know, you just have to go with it and until somebody's learned that. I think it's just really scary and it makes it harder for people to offer help. So if you reach out and you ask and you say, and, and be specific or say, I, I'm struggling with X and Y. Is there anything you can, is there any way you can help? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even if they can't do either X or Y, maybe they'll find a Z to help you with. So, Right. That's it. Exactly. And as adult children, you know, I, I think there's a, you know, there, at least there, it's worth exploring whether we could be the one to, to kind of facilitate that in some situations, you know, because sometimes our, our parent who's busy caring for our loved one who's got Alzheimer's, you know, they may be bu too busy to start making phone calls. And sometimes that's one way that an adult child, you know, I'm not. <laughs> so I'm somebody who, oh boy, you really wouldn't want me in the kitchen cooking for you, you know. But there are <laughs> other things that I do and I enjoy doing. And, um, you know, so that could be, you know, either putting together by phoning people. Uh, you know, you might be able to find someone who's willing to come over and sit with your loved one for an hour one afternoon right in the courtyard how nice is that um or or you know even using one of these online tools like caring bridge or something can can you put together lists of people who who are willing to rotate in and out and do things um you know this is where adult children who kind of have some of these more modern skills can maybe pitch in a little bit and take something off, uh, take that part, the administration part off of our parents. You know, it's an idea. Mm hmm Well, there's lots of ways we can help. Just have to be creative. There you go. That's and the, the more it, willing we are to be improvisational um, and creative during Alzheimer's, the better. Because we're constantly going to be faced with um, things that we've yet to ever be faced with before, right? It's going to be one new thing after another. And so the more that we're ready to uh, just give things a try, 
you know, try responding in this way. Tomorrow, try responding in that way. See which works better on any given day. Anything could. So the more that we kind of get, get a little comfortable with that, the better. I believe that. The one thing I want to end with, because I don't want to suck up your entire evening, is I tried to facilitate help through my dad as like the conduit. And I have learned now that that was a barrier. And if there was a way of surrounding him with people that have said, hey, I can step in and help with this and I can you know, take Diane out on these days or blah, blah, blah. I think he might've been less resistant. Mm -hmm. He might've needed a little coaxing or a lot of coaxing. And I realize now that, you know, running all the suggestions through him, well, why don't you talk to Gloria about why it frustrates you that you have no idea when she's bringing mom back? It, you know, and I don't know if he was having, if it was the stress of caring for my mother and his chronic illnesses, or if it was a sign of the early cognitive impairment that, you know, was so easy to miss. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was just his personality. That's highly probable. But I, if I could have gone around and formed a committee around him, I think that would have been a lot better. And I really wish I could have done that for him. Yeah, you know, we all are doing the best that we can. And, and that's the important thing, right? That you were showing up and you were doing things. That's, isn't that what drives you to do this podcast? I know that that's what drives me to write my um, blog and to keep telling stories and lead sessions to educate is that there were so many things that uh, you know i hope that there were so many things that i see more clearly now that i could not see then and um that's part of why i enjoy just trying to talk about this and share the ideas because in the hopes that maybe i can help somebody see something that they didn't think of before because what happens with our um the care partner, right? The one who is helping the person with Alzheimer's, they are so, they have so much going on, right? They are doing all their normal things for caring for themselves, all their usual chores that they have around the house, whatever they are. And then they are caring for all the physical things that our loved one needs and picking up little by little all of those chores that that person did. So you talk about somebody who has no more room on their list, right? It's, it's that care partner. They have no more room. And, and so any little thing that we can do to take something off their list and maybe supplement a little extra care, a little extra attention, you know, um, I look back now and I think about all those days my dad used to mow the lawn. He loved working in the yard, but he would lock my mom in the sunroom. <laughs> she could look out the window and watch him. But, you know, and he felt like, well, she was safe in there, which is true. She couldn't get to the kitchen, to the stove or anything. But, you know, um, she, my mom was super social. There were better... Wait, there were better ideas, right? You know, it certainly would have been a grand idea for, to have a few of her friends drop by and spend that time with her. Uh, and if I had thought about it back then and taken the initiative, I probably could have organized a few people to come on a certain days of the week and whatever, but it had never occurred to me. And so, you know, that's part of why I think both of us, right, do this now is to try to share the the, the situations we're in so that, then, hey, you know what? I want the next peop next families to come to do it better than I did. <laughs> you know, that's um, when I share this timeline in Patterns in Time, the one thing when I'm teaching it that I make sure everybody understands, right? This is different than a how-to. This is the opposite of a how-to. This is, these are the choices that one family under stress made. You do better than we did, right? That's, that's it, right? you look at this and go, oh, we should do X instead of that, instead of Y. We should do A instead of B. That's great. I want you to do better than we did. That's definitely. Def that's definitely what motivates me every day. Well, caregivers are under so much 
overwhelm and stress. It's like, yeah. you know, when you've got 15 things you've got to do and that phone call that should have taken 15 minutes took 45 and now you're behind, blah, you're just losing your mind. That is how I feel all the time dealing with my mom and I don't live with her. And it's much easier to understand why my dad was the way he was. Mm -hmm. So when you say they don't have any more room on their plate to deal with stuff, you know, just like make a decision. Do you want so-and-so to take, you know, mom to the quilt, quilting bee or to the seroptimist or out to tag along on errands, which I still don't understand why she did that. You know, she was trying, she was doing what she could to help. Right. And it just, it was hard for my dad to accept it in the way she was giving it. And, you know, it helps to understand that, you know, when you're so overwhelmed, sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta put your foot down and say, I'm going to take care of this for you and it'll be fine. And then just yeah. go do it. <laughs> That's what I wish I'd learned. Have, we, we all bring a lifetime of experience with our parents to, to Alzheimer's, right? Now, my mom had early onset. So she <laughs> so started, <does> <laughs> yeah, so she started showing symptoms at 61. Um, and, you know, and I, but it's the same thing. So I was in my 40s. Um, but it would be the same thing if the parent is, in their 80s and showing signs of Alzheimer's, right? We have a whole life of experience and, and you know, things that we never confronted our parents about, things that we always confronted our parents about, we always pushed too much, we didn't push enough, whatever. And we bring all of that with us to Alzheimer's. Um, and, you know, as long as, you know, um, I have this little logo here that is on my website and it's a brain with a big heart in the middle. And um, my whole perspective about Alzheimer's and about what my dad needed from me, I thought he needed me to do things. I thought he needed me to, you know, what he needed was more love, right? <laughs> he needed more love. He needed me to show him more love. And love sometimes sounded like just listening to him. And sometimes love is being compassionate and understanding that this man is, I feel like I'm under stress. He is in a pressure cooker, right? He is, his, his stress is so much higher than mine. Um, and so being patient with him, um, being his punching bag, my dad kind of has an anger problem, right? And so I, fortunately, it wasn't a literal punching bag, but my dad needs to vent and he gets angry about something. Guess who got it all, right? Because you know, um, and yeah, on my good days, I could, I would take it and, you know, and be, respond compassionately and understand. Then I had other days where, uh, you know, I was less wonderful about it. I, you know, I just felt like if every day I could just show him more love, then I was on the right path. No, that's a, I think that's probably a great place to end is that it is such a stressful job to do and caregiver is a job, it's not a relationship. As long as we can show people love, they'll probably accept help a little bit more and everybody will be better. Wonderful, thanks. It's been so nice chatting with you today, Jennifer. It's been a joy. I appreciate it and you have a fantastic evening. Thank you very much, you do the same. Thanks, bye-bye. Take care.